Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Meet the Author event, um, one of a series of book readings run by the University of St Andrews Alumnus Office, and the first of two book events today uh, to be followed uh, by Gary McKenzie at five o'clock talking about his book, Scotland, A Literary Guide for Travellers. And there, for those of you going to both these book talks, there is a different meeting link for that second talk um, later following this one. I'm Jane Pettigree and I teach at the University of St Andrews Music Centre and in the School of English. And it's my great pleasure today in this session uh, to be meeting with you uh, Shirley Mackay, whose Hugh Cullen crime mysteries based in Renaissance St Andrews seem to be the perfect read for this St Andrews Alumnus Weekend, especially for those of you who have just enjoyed the virtual Renaissance tour. There are now six Hugh Cullen books in print published by Polygon, as well as Shirley's short anthology of history and anecdote, The Wee Book of Fife. Shirley Mackay was born in Tynemouth, moving to Scotland at a young age. Aged 15, she won the Young Observer Playwriting Competition. Her first degree in English and Linguistics was from the University of St Andrews, and she went on from here to postgraduate research in Romantic and 17th century prose writing at Durham University. She now lives in Crail in the East Nuka Fife, where she works as a writer and an academic proofreader. Her first Hugh Cullen novel, which we will be particularly discussing today, Hue and Cry, was shortlisted for the Crime Writers Association Debut Dagger Prize. The sixth book in this series span a 10 year period from 1579 to 1588 and follow the developing career of lawyer academic Hugh Cullen and his friends and family in St Andrews and in other books further afield. So today, this afternoon, we're first going to hear from Shirley, who's going to introduce her stories and their key players, and we'll read a bit from Hugh and Cry, the first book in the series. And then about half an hour in, we'll be taking and discussing your questions. So if you want to ask any questions, please could you type these into the Q&A chat panel in this meeting. If you look for the little speech bubble in the instruction panel on your screen, that's where you can find the, the chat. I'll be picking up your questions from there and passing them over to Shirley to answer. And we'll aim to finish at about four o'clock. Um, so now over to you, Shirley. Thank you, Jane. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Jane and Elaine from the Development Office who's invited me to talk to you all and Colin and um, Eddie who are making sure that the technology works and I've just managed to, to scupper it slightly so they've got me back on track which I'm very grateful for. Um, but most of all to thank you um, the audience. I can't see you but it's immensely comforting to know that you're there. And I've been thinking, um, particularly this weekend, with it being the alumnus weekend, um, quite nostalgically about my time at St Andrews. I'm conscious that many of you might have liked to have been here and can't be. And in that spirit of nostalgia, I'd like to begin by reading a short passage from the opening to the first book, Hue and Cry, where Hugh, Cullen the hero, is returning to St Andrews after several years of absence overseas. So, um, you know, to get us in the mood. And the year is um, 1579. So, from the deck of the Dutch flyboat Zedrag, a young man looked out to shore. As the land unfurled before him like a map, he began to feel less sick. For it was not the motion of the ship, but the length of his absence that caused his soft belly to flutter and fall. The sight of the town reassured him. It looked as it had always done, fronted by the ramparts of its castle, edged on the horizon by the starkness of its rock. Perhaps it was a trick of the light, but the strip of land between the castle and the shore appeared to have diminished as it weathered the encroaching of the tide. And the cathedral, by the square-built tower and chapel of St Rool, had crumbled further into stone, allowing the sunlight to stream through its frame and illuminate the town that had grown up in its shade. Beyond, from east to west, were ranked the four main, the four main thoroughfares, the fair and leafy South Street with its colleges and kirk, the broad and bustling Market Gate, the North Street with its college halls and chapel braced against the winds, the Swallow Gate 
that opened on the castle gate and cliffs, falling sheer into the water, sweeping west towards the links and eastwards to the harbour where the shallow basin washed into the sea. These four streets converged on the cathedral and with their rigs and gardens set the pattern of the town. Crisscrossed between them from north to south, Venels, wines and closes narrowed and made deep its inner life. True to its name, the flyboat had crossed the North Sea from Holland fiercely and swiftly and soon disgorged its contents in the sunlit bay. The young man, Hugh Cullen, found little to detain him. Since he was no merchant, he had nothing to declare. In fact, he had nothing at all. He had travelled from France through Flanders to Camp Fear, where he was shown to one boat and his belongings inexplicably were thrown upon another bound for Leith. He had only a purse of French coin and the fine suit of French clothes he stood up in, which now seemed unfit for the drab Scottish soil. He felt a pleasing lightness as he scrambled from the boat, coming back as a stranger to find his old faith with the town. St Andrews was constructed on parallel streets within and between which its business took place. He climbed from the harbour through the sea gate to the pens that opened out upon the South Street. Behind him stood the old cathedral and the priory vaults and cloisters where the merchants thronged on fair days. To the right, the grand houses, some in mid-construction, where they pawned their wealth. On his left, and here he paused, were the college and the chapel of St Leonard. This was where, as a boy of 14, he had first entered the university to begin the education that had taken him to France. For four years, he had worked and dreamt behind these quiet walls. Since it was September now, the gates were closed. The term would not begin for several weeks and the present crop of students had not yet arrived to straggle obediently from college to Kirk, from lecture to links, snaking through the town. From Hugh's point of view, perspective, we might say, St Andrews is built up of parallel streets. In reality, of course, the thoroughfares of South Street, Market Street and North Street and beyond them the Swallowgate, which is now called the Scores, converge on the cathedral, as you can see if you climb up Rules Tower. But walk on the ground and the lines do appear straight. The illusion is reflected in the bird's eye plan drawn in the drawn of the town in the 16th century called the Getty map. I've got a picture of it up here which may well fall down before the hour is up and um, another one which I'll hold to camera for anyone who, who's not familiar with it and you'll see that on this on this drawing the streets do look parallel. There's some uncertainty and I know that there's research ongoing now um, in the School of History as to the author and date of this map. Uh, the National Library of Scotland, who supply these images and hold the copyright, do date it to circa 1580 and attribute it to John Geddes or Geddy, a St Andrews graduate, contemporary to Hugh. It's as close as we come, whatever the case, to a real life depiction of Hugh St Andrews in the circa 1580s, and it's remarkably close to our own. So we can be sure that whoever drew this map knew and walked those streets. Many of the buildings look the same today. There are parallels here in more ways than one. One of the most alluring things about St Andrews as a setting for a work of historical fiction is that the medieval footprint of the town remains intact and visible, approached from land or sea. Later in the book, Hugh walks to St Andrews with his sister Meg from their father's house the view from the south as they come upon the town is the same one I see today coming in from Crail, where we live, through sunshine and through Ha. And I'm just going to read a short passage from a little At Kinkle Brays, they turned off from the road and made their way towards the shore. For a while, the path led them through thick swathes of thistle and thorn, where leafy fern and marram grass obscured the water's edge. Meg filled her basket with brambles and rose hips, and as they fought their way through clumps of weed, they feasted on blackberries and were children again, forgetting their shyness, chasing through the nettles and the gorse. Presently, as they came closer to the cliffs, they saw the ragged outline of the maiden rock, 
and beyond it, the outcrop of shoreline, black against the smoothness of the sea. A thousand seabirds fleck the rocks, from the stillness of the water to the pallid wash of cloud, forming layers of muted colours to the hills beyond. The landscape rose in strips of undulating flatness, the rocks a streak of blackness and the grey rush of the water, and the sea a streak of darkness in the whiteness of the sky. Then, as the light changed, they saw the pale arc of the bay, the curvature of windswept sand, coloured like the harvest, ripe against the perfect blue of the sea. The beach circled round to the pier, where the waters broke and scattered freely, sending spray like sleet above the harbour wall. And rising from the bay, they saw the town. In 1579, nostalgia has already set in. Hugh is aware of the change. His sense when he arrives from the wider world that the strip of land between the castle and the shore has diminished since the last time he was here is a constant threat and is poignant still, where rapid expansion on one side is set against coastal erosion, dissolving the physical landscape. Sand was once stone and stone became sand. In Hugh's day, there was still pasture land at the bottom of the cliffs. As the castle moves closer into the sea, stone from the cathedral is harvested to build new houses on the South Street. The town is moving on. The freshly painted ceiling of Hugh's cousin's house in Hugh and Cry was inspired by the one in the merchant's house, which was open as a coffee house in the 1980s when I was a student. Uh, now it's a private home, you can't see it. The house had a strange medicinal smell, like green wood, newly oiled. Hugh felt his way into the central hall and in the pricking of the light began to make sense of what he saw. It was like looking in a glass, his fears illuminate, the rafters grim and lurching like a gallows in the fog. He saw sullen purples lolling, slack and swollen blues, the hangsman, hanged man's face become a bowl of fruits. He was not looking into a glass, but up to ceilings bright with pictures, florid birds and trailing foliage, varnished apples, bulbous pears. The pictures in the coffee house were less grotesque than these, and I know that I drank tea there many times. I feel a bit sad given the attention paid to Meg and Giles to eating in my books. There are lots and lots of meals that I can't remember anything that we had to eat, but doubtless there was cake. Hugh Cullen is a child of the Scottish Reformation, born in Edinburgh, 1555. His mother dies in childbed with his sister Meg. His father, Matthew, a successful advocate, required, retires to Kenley Green, four miles from St Andrews in 1567. There's a reason why I set this house outside the town. Boundaries and peripheries, the urban and the pastoral, license and constraint are themes that recur in all the books. Distance is a lens, a slant or new perspective, which may be an illusion after all. Hugh has been brought up as a Protestant, humanist and Calvinist in outlook and beliefs, though his father remains a staunch Catholic. Hugh is also educated, tolerant and sceptical. As reconstructed as possible for a Scottish male in the 16th century, which was a prerequisite for his role as amateur detective in the early modern world. He's not, I plead for him, quite anachronistic, but he is uniquely privileged equipped with the advantages, resources and connections possible for him to have accessed at the time. He is entirely reconstructed, but from original parts. In 1569, he matriculates at St Leonard's College, St Andrews, graduating Master of Arts in 1573. At 18, he's sent to the Scots College in Paris to complete his education in the law, where he meets Giles Locke, who is studying medicine. Neither could be studied at St Andrews at the time. And they're re reunited at the start of Hue and Cry. Hugh has returned unwillingly from France to begin his training at the bar. Um, that actually takes place in the second book, um, Fate and Fortune. And Giles has a position at the College of St Salvator or St Salvators. Before returning home, Hugh seeks him out and he finds him in his rooms at the college gate in the turret tower. And that's the building which has the blue plaque on the wall to the admirable Crichton, that legendary prodigy and paragon of Scots Renaissance man, and some of you may remember. 
Lying on the floor of Giles Locke's tower, Hugh felt at home for the first time since leaving France. Giles had dragged a feather mattress into the centre of the room, on which his friend lay sprawling, gazing at the walls. The room was filled with objects from the Rue des Fosses, no less familiar because they were strange. Discoloured substances floating in jars, compasses, astrolabes, globes and nocturnals, pigs' feet and goats' teeth, the beak of a gull. Giles Locke's turret tower does not look back into the quad, but outward to the world. It used to house the old union and, in my day, the School of Linguistics, deep in its Warren of room, Rooms. And I use the word school, which was not common then, instead of department, because in the true sense, that's what it was. The professor, Jan Mulder, had developed the theory of axiomatic functionalism, for which it was known as the St Andrews School. And rare for its time, it attracted international students. I didn't come to St Andrews intending to embark on the study of linguistics. I came to do English and to read English literature, as I had always done and known that I would do. And so I did. And in later years, I married Neil Rhodes, who taught me English in third year. What stronger endorsement than that? But when I arrived, I took first arts linguistics, drawn in by a talk at the Freshers Fair, where nothing that was said made any kind of sense to me. And it was irresistible. By the end of the second year, I began to see and learn to think, or I thought I did. And so I ended up taking the joint honours degree. And the linguistics course was closed in 1983, too rarefied and small to escape the funding acts. And my cohort was the final one. But it taught me to think in a different way, not just about language and thought, but thinking itself. And it changed what I saw when I looked at the world, which is what education ought to be about. So the turret tower seemed to me a fitting home for Giles, who was in the cusp of all that passed for science in the 16th century, and has an equivocal, searching, curious mind. His energy, humanity and fondness for controversy, his passion for what seemed to us his slightly bonkers theories, have parallels for me with the old linguistic school, though they are illusions after all. Fair to say, perhaps, that his skills are hampered rather than enhanced by his own philosophies and the limitations of his time. Whereas science fails him, he has Hugh's sister Meg, whose pragmatic knowledge of the use of medicine is a foil to his, and all of the resources, equipment and technologies placed at his disposal make him, for his day, cutting edge. At the end of Fate and Fortune, the second book, he's appointed Visitor for Fife and the visitor's um, role was to look into and report to the magistrates on unnatural deaths. So he assumes the role in detective fiction of forensic scientist or pathologist, which is less absurd than it might seem. The 1980s, sad to say, were not a golden age for Scottish universities, and St Andrews itself had long been in decline. It's perhaps only in the last 20 years that it's recovered to the kind of reputation it had first enjoyed in Andrew Melville's time as an intellectual powerhouse far above its size. And that's strange to think of now. But the 1580s really were the first glory days. By the 17th century, once the king and his court had left Scotland for good, the wrath had already set in. Hence the proposition in the 1690s to move the university to Perth. And the reasons were quite clearly set out. The victuals are dearer here than anywhere else, viz, flesh, drinks of all sorts. This place is ill provided of all commodities and trades, which obliges us to send to Edinburgh and provide ourselves with shoes, clothes, hats, and what are here are double rate. This place is ill provided of fresh water, the most part being served with a stripe where the foul clothes, herring, fish, etc., are washed, so it is in the most part nasty and unwholesome. This place is a most thin and piercing air, even to an excess. And this is the reason why old men coming to this place are pre-instantly cut off. As also why malignant infections and diseases have begun to begin and rage most here, and last year a most malignant flux where have died upwards of 200 persons in a few weeks, which much prejudiced the university. 
This place being now only a village where most part farmers dwell, the whole streets are filled with dunghills, which are exceedingly noisome and ready to infect the air, especially at this season when the herring guts are exposed in them. The disposition of this people is much set upon tumultuating, as did appear in the year 1690, when they chased the colleges, students into the colleges and brought their cannons to the very gates to throw down the college. And one of their tradesmen, drawing a winger to Dr. Skeen within the college, threatened to murder him in the same year, threatening to drag him to prison. The aversion and hatred they have to learning and learned men. And their present design of robbing the new college, which they are not ashamed to publish. Appealing though all of this is, town and gown relations at their lowest ebb, there are compelling reasons for setting a historical fiction series in the St Andrews of the 1580s rather than the 60s or the 1980s, or for me at least, at almost any other time. Reformation changes everything, but human nature still remains the same. The opening to the series is set precisely in the academic year 1579 to 80 to coincide with the reformers blueprint for a new foundation of St Andrews University in advance of the arrival of Andrew Melville and with the royal progress of the young King James VI in his 14th year. The King was rarely seen before that time, but during that first progress he visited St Andrews where he saw a play, the germ of the seed of the one in hue and cry. And I intended at the beginning of the series that these stories would progress from the coming of the king to the union of the crowns in 1603 and that Hugh's life in some sense would be entwined with the life of James. At the present rate it seems quite unlikely that I'll ever get to the end of 1603. I did not intend to write them in real time or even to record the great events of history but history is endlessly suggestive and it's the small things not the grand intrigues that tend to draw me in. It's a windmill, a picture, a play, things which are the stuff of lived lives. The play is recorded in the diary of James Melville, or more properly the memoirs, and Mel Melville's account of his own time at St Andrews were naturally an early inspiration for the books. I've fallen shy of reinventing Melville as a character in the books, though his uncle Andrew has a role in friend and foe. James appears obliquely, in the postscript, for example, to the Martinmas story in 1588, A Calendar of Crime. But I had no will to draw him from the life, though no one's more fitting for a more obvious a friend for Hugh. I'm not quite sure why. In the one place where his absence may seem inexplicable, Andrew Melville's crisis at the start of Friend and Foe, he was quite conveniently absent in real life in Edinburgh on his honeymoon marrying in May, which the almanacs would certainly have cautioned him against. Or so we have it from his own account. His record of his life begins with the clear assertion that he was born the 25th day of the month July in the year of our Lord, 1556. To which he adds the note, my uncle, Mr Andrew, holds that I was born in 1557. So fiction, after all, may be more secure. Histories, like memories, are underpinned with doubt. Years ago, in 1998 to be more precise, I visited King's College Aberdeen and saw an exhibition which was part of the quincentennial celebrations, which had a reconstruction of an early student's room, more like a monastic cell, with a modern of a regent, as the tutors were called, visiting him at night. And for a while there was a virtual three-dimensional record of this exhibition online. Now both this and the original have disappeared and left no trace. No one I've spoken to at, Edinburgh, at Aberdeen remembers them. I do know the date from the back of a photograph which was taken at the time and from my husband who was with me and he can corroborate that I didn't imagine this. It left a great impression on me and the vision of that room was fixed in my mind when I wrote Hue and Cry. If it is unearthed, and comes to light again, I wouldn't be surprised if it was nothing like the picture that I remember. And at the same time in Aberdeen, I bought a little book about the regulation of the university, which led me to look into the new foundation of St Andrews too, and opened up the door to Hugh and Giles. 
And under its terms, St Mary's, called the New College, was to be explicitly a college of theology to train up the ministers for the new Kirk. The two other colleges, St Leonardus and St Salvatore's, were to be reformed in such a way that the youth may attain into perfect knowledge of humanity and true philosophy, with four ordinary professors or regents beside the principal, teaching the first year the basics of Greek, with exercises and composition for the first six months in Latin and the rest in Greek. In the second year, the students were to be taught the precepts of invention, disposition and elocution in both languages through study of the best authors. In the third year, they should progress to the logic, politics and ethics of Aristotle, all in Greek, and the offices of Cicero in Latin. In the fourth year, they would study Aristotle's physics and the spheres. And it was proposed to that the principal of St Salvator's should be a medicina, a professor of medicine, and the principal of St Leonard's, a specialist in the philosophy of Plato, and that the lawyer and mathematician at that time in the new college should be transferred to St Salvator's. Their roles in the stories are assumed by Giles and Hugh. In fact, the mathematician and um, lawyer were the same person, and I invented another mathematician for Time and Tide who is, whose party growed. Because most of these reforms, of course, never did take place. The resistance of the colleges to any kind of change are shown in Hue and Cry, in the Whitsunday story, in the calendar of crime, and in real life, in the lasting records of the Crown Commissioners, whose inspections were frustrated, thwarted and ignored well into the middle of the 18th century. But the principle is there. It allowed me to appropriate for Giles Locke and for Hugh the positions of physician and professor of the law, and to establish by the end of the second book, the roles of gentleman detective and forensic scientist, if you like, within the limits and the license of the 16th century. Hugh's understanding of the law and the practice of medicine by Giles Locke are defined precisely by their place and time. The people they depose, the provost James Martin and the lawyer William Wellwood, I have quite shamelessly usurped. Wellwood wrote a tract on Scots maritime law, which was the legal source for Hugh on the shipwreck in Time and Tide, and a Latin pamphlet on hydraulics, which lies behind Giles Locke's experiments with plumbing in Friend and Foe. I'm not sure if that mitigates or compounds the theft, but it does mean that his part in this has not been overlooked. Perhaps the lines converge. Giles and Hugh are frauds. They can be nothing else, but they are well informed. Thank you very, Thank you very much, much. We have we a have couple, a couple of, questions of questions in, in um, excellent. which I will work which through will work and through. there's room, of course, for, for more, more as we as we discuss these. Um, the first two in are actually um, linked, um, I think, and they speak to the fact that what you're doing um, is both a historical novel, as you've so beautifully explained, and also a crime novel. Yes. Uh, and both of these have have, you know, things that, that very intricately needs to be thought through. Um, Colin H asks, how much planning do you do before, uh, do you complete before starting your novels? Do you have a rigid plan or is everything flexible? Uh, and, and sort of related to that, we have Trevor who is worrying in a subsequent event um, a book, not in Hue and Cry. Um, there, there's, there's an accident on the 4th as Hugh's trying to, to cross um, oh, yes. on the ferry uh, and he's rex he's rescued by his excellent horse, who's one of mm. my, as you, as you know, <laughs> I love the horse. Yes. Uh, and Trevor finds himself rather worried about what actually happened to the boatman who was trying to get across. <laughs> uh, so this is the sort of problem you have, you know, with crime fiction is, um, is. people I've worrying about all those forensic details. Um, so I'll put both uh, Colin's question about um, rigid advance planning versus flexibility uh, and Trevor's anxiety about uh, the poor boatman um, into the public domain now. These are very good questions. Thank you, um, Colin and Trevor. Um, I'm a poor planner, I would say, and I tend to work and write thematically and I will start with a plan and as it goes on, um, you know, it will become more and more involved and things will become obvious to me at some stage of the plotting that it can only go in one direction. But when I begin, you know, I, I can see it going in, in 
in lots of direction. It's a very organic process for me. The only book where I had a very strong sense from the start where and how the book was going to end, um, it didn't. The ending didn't work. And when I had an alternative ending, um, which had came into my mind, um, usually it's about three quarters of the way through the book. I suddenly see where this is going and where the, where the book is going to end and how, how the actual plot is going to work out. The plot is always um, composed of, of various strands which are suggested to me usually by very small, you know, very small events or sometimes even objects and by the, the characters themselves and the way they develop in the course of telling the story. And as I say, there will be a point at which I know, you know, it could go in very many directions, but it can only logically go in one direction. It was the fourth book, Friend and Foe. I had pre-decided where the book was going to end and it absolutely didn't work. And when I gave it to the publisher, they said, this ending doesn't work. And I said, yes, I know. Well, I did think of an alternative ending three quarters of the way through and it was this, but I had committed myself in my mind to working towards, towards this plot ending. And they said, no, no, you know, go back to the, to the one that you do, follow your instincts, which is, which is what I did. Um, I would say I, I do plan out a lot of it in advance. Obviously, I know if there's a murder, I know who the murderer is. But there are all sorts of patterns and connections which emerge in the process of writing, which are not necessarily consciously there from the start. And that's, you know, massively satisfying for me because I, I'm juggling so many different strands as well. There is the historical element. There is a, a, there is the setting, the double setting of time and place, which has to be maintained. There is the characterization. And then there is having a, within that, circumscribed within that, a, a, a fairly conventional detective fiction <laughs> plot. And there will be times when, you know, one thing takes precedence over another and, and it goes in directions. I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is something that my publishers get very frustrated about, that they would probably prefer that they were more plot driven and that the plots were clearer and um, clearer laid out from the start. But um, I, I would say it is just an organic process and uh, I don't always know when I begin where it's going to end. I will do quite a bit of research beforehand, um, some ongoing research, you know, into individual things as I'm, I'm as I'm writing it, for example, um, you know, telescope. Did they have telescopes? <laughs> you know, or uh, the perspective glass um, uh, element which comes in, in one of the book. And, and if they were available, is there a possibility, you know, would Giles have had access to them? Is there a way that he can have access to this technology? So there's always, there's always those aspects of things that you have to take into account, bearing in mind the, the genre. But um, it, it's challenging to do. One of the nice things is that the, the history does provide a context so you don't have to make everything up. <laughs> so you're not, you're not starting with an absolutely blank canvas. You have something there for the imagination to, to work with. I don't know if that, if that actually answers <laughs> the question. I think I think we'll we'll just all collectively continue to worry about the poor boatman who maybe wasn't saved by the, the horse. Boatman, yes. <laughs> Well, actually, there was something I was going to say about that, which was um, these books are very heavy, heavily populated <laughs> and I accumulate quite a lot of, of, of characters who have walk on parts. And when I wrote The Calendar of Crime, 1588, which is the last book in the series, anyone who sort of reads, has read all the books and reads very attentively might notice that each of those stories features as a main character a character who had a very minor role in each of the earlier books in order. <laughs> so the boatman may well turn up. <laughs> I'll bear him in mind because if that was the case for um, Elspeth, who, who comes into the Lama story in that book and she was recovered from um, from time and tide and it was that was me waking up in the middle of the night thinking goodness I what happened to Elspeth she was just she was just abandoned <laughs> I need to write a story for her I need to recover her so I will I will bear in mind the boatman and <laughs> and I will try to <laughs> perhaps um, resurrect him for another for another story these are the these um the the story um of, of the, the boat capsizing was was that, that did happen in real life so it's um and, and boatman did drown certainly that's one of these things which um 
I think one of the reviewers thought was quite far-fetched and nonsensical, but uh, you know, you can't actually um, underestimate the danger of taking your livestock across water on a boat. And people did, I mean, you had to, it was the only way that you could, that you could get there. And of course, St Andrews still has a working harbour today. It yes. still has lobster creels and all the the, the fish related stuff that was back there. That, that the danger of the sea is still a, yes. a pressing danger yes. at certain yes. times of the year in particular. Uh, yes. The next question I've got is a rather lovely one that springs out of the um, attention that you have to the landscape. You talk about time, placed in time, mm -hmm. um, but as your readings demonstrated, your books have a beautiful sensitivity to the, the Scottish Fife landscape. Uh, and this is really a question about the, obviously you live in Fife, so, so you're, yes. you're, you're aware of what it really looks like, uh, but this is a question about perhaps um, other art, artistic um, representations of this area. Uh, Volkmar from Germany is asking, uh, when I studied in St Andrews, says Volkmar in 1995 to 96, I got to know Jurek Putter in his studio oh, on South yes, Street. Yes. And he, of course, reconstructed Scotland, but especially St Andrews in, in the Middle Ages, a little bit before the Renaissance, most of his material is late middle middle ages pre-reformation in very detailed ink drawings have you encountered uh, incorporated his research into your books asks volkmar i'm very aware of the pictures and i was at the time when i, I was a student and um you know in, in recent years i have i have sought for them and they're quite difficult to they, they, you know, he did have a website for a while and it seems to have you know it, it seems to have disappeared which, which is a pity but i'm quite sure that they did um imprint themselves on my on my consciousness at the time because i was certainly aware of them um, i think they're probably one of the things that were seminal in <laughs> you know not in not in more recent years when i was writing but um but back in the beginning and yes yes they are e extraordinary extraordinary drawings yeah, I think he was working from the nice 70s. Again, it would be nice to, I think they do a revival, they really are. It would be nice if someone could collect them and, and put them on the internet or, or um, make them accessible. I've, I've looked for a, a book of them to buy and haven't, haven't been able to, to find one in recent years. Didn't they have one at the swimming pool in St Andrews for a while? I don't know. Um, they they quite, did. Yes. But there's somewhere else I'm thinking where there used to be one displayed, but but possibly not any longer. He, he, for anyone wondering, he, he is still in St Andrews because he quite often sits in a lay-by at the bottom of my road, um, up on the hill above St Andrews, um, photographing and, and still documenting. So he's, he's actually still That's working. extraordinary that he's still... Yeah. <laughs> he's still so yes, if any, if any of you, he would have actually been a lovely illustrator, lovely cover, color, cover illustrator for, um, for the very book. intricate, um, yeah. bird's oh, eye yeah. perspective. Yeah, no, that's, views. that's fabulous. Um, but it, as you said in your talk, Shirley, um, you you start with the Reformation as a point of departure, which happened in Scotland in 1560, of course, and yes. Yorick's um, engravings. Um, are particularly interested in pre-reformation yes. St Andrews when yes, the pilgrims exactly. are still coming yes, and yes. the cathedral is still extant yes. um, and, and trying to reimagine uh, what, yes. what that what that skyline would, would have looked like. Um, so I have I'm, I'm one, reading your books it always strikes me that your uh, your meticulous attention to, to history has introduced to me um, the reality of, of, of a whole load of trades that I never really thought quite so much about before encountering your books. You know, the, the, the mechanisms in the first book in Hue and Cry, uh, which is all about the cloth trade and dyeing. Yeah. Um, and we learn a great deal about dyeing, different types of dyes, different colours. Um, of all the different trades and things that you've researched for your books, uh, which do you think has given you personally uh, the most pleasure to to discover uh, new facts about. That's a really um, a really interesting question. Um, I think that th this is ra a rather bizarre thing because, of course, St Andrew being a borough did have representatives of all the trade, and the university has some very nice collections of um, of the the accounts and the trade books, the Baxter's books and the Hammerman book. And there's an extraordinary um, they, they did an exhibition. Um, 
uh, for the town actually where where they sh they showed off some of these books and the um the hammerman had an extraordinary hand drawn i, I don't actually ha use the write about the hammerman in any of my in any of my books it's the baxters um who feature in, in the third book, but the Hammerman have this extraordinary picture, um, hand-drawn picture of, of Christ on the cross, and it's because they they made the nails for the cross, and it, it just seemed <laughs> extraordinary to me to think that they would celebrate or that they would <laughs> somehow <laughs> align themselves with with their trade being that it's almost sort of like the Judas the Judas trade so that's immensely intriguing but um because as I say you know because it's a borough you are aware that everybody is somehow affiliated to something and that's uh, and these um social structures are very very rigid and that is is, is something that I found appealing in, in terms of crime fiction, because everybody is defined in this period altogether, really, by their not as an individual, but by their position in relation to the guild, if it's a trade guild, or the church, or um, you know, or the king, or everybody is part of an institution. And um, I'm interested in those sort of itinerant characters who are outside that, like peddlers and um, gypsies and people who sort of pass through, who have license to comment on and, and notice that. And but it, it, it's quite difficult to imagine your entire so social world being constrained by by such a small thing, whether it's the guild or um, or the university or the church or the or the school, and that everything is ever everything is a sort of microcosm of society, but on a on a smaller level. The Baxters, there were seventy bakers in St Andrews at this time which does seem extraordinary because of course it takes you know bread is the staple and it takes a lot of people to be able to everything being handcrafted it takes a lot of people to to just produce the bread and people who are a member of a guild have status because they are producing the stuff of life and whatever you need whatever commodity you need it has to be made and it's you know made by by individuals so that at the fairs when they're selling the hammerman are selling their their goods everything you know anything that you need has been crafted by someone whether it's a pot or a pan or a even even a nail has been handmade and i think that um so these people are actually essential for for life to go on and it's fascinating thank you and um, now your your discussion there about families um I really appreciated in this book the way in which you you discussed families with great delicacy. We have, you know, it's sometimes said by historians back in the let's say 1970s, 1980s that somehow um, parents in the pre-modern time had so many children they didn't really have the same mm. effective connection yeah. that modern parents have. But actually, your the care that you take with families. Um, the different types of relationships that people have with their children, their parents, and and as you say, the people maybe who aren't part of those normal structures, seem to me something that really interested me, um, and that you'd taken a lot of care about. Would you like to say um, something about the different families that you've you've got in in your first book, for example, in Hue and Cry? Yes, I, I just want to begin by saying I don't buy into the the belief that. Um, people in the early modern age did not cherish and value their children and you know that that sort of just came in with romanticism and and I remember seeing a, an infant grave from the early 16th century where the tombstone the ep for a two-year-old child and the um, um, the epigraph was something like um, father's boy mother's joy and you just feel that actually you know <laughs> that, that that says it all so I think that um, the problem that you know, the, the head of the, fa the family obviously has a great sense of duty first to his family or perhaps you know he has a sense of duty to God, he has a sense of duty to the king or to whatever lord is um, above him and he certainly will have a you know a sense of duty and feeling towards his family and these things are often in um, conflict. I think what people did not have was the sense of themselves as individuals that we have today. 
post dramatic. I think they saw themselves socially, but I certainly think that they valued their children um, and not just as status sim symbols, but um, you know, that they valued and loved their children. So Hugh's family, um, I mean, part of his his character, and I suppose this is a, a convention of the genre as well, is that, um, you know, he, he is remote to some degree from his family because he's been educated. His father has um, strategically and politically educated him in the Protestant Kirk instead of the, 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 the Catholic Church, which, of course, he remains um, attached to himself because he is a, a shrewd man and a lawyer and he wants his son to get on the world. And this has, has estranged you to some extent from his own family and I suppose makes it more difficult for him to, um, you know, his, his own personal relationships are more troubled because of that. And to some extent, that's a sort of cliche of the, the lonely <laughs> detective. Uh, but it, it also allows him to have a slightly more modern perspective on, on many things, to be slightly less dutiful than he might have been as a son, because um, it, it's certainly the case that in this period, children would have been dutiful to their parents and would have sought their parents' blessings for, which is not to say that they weren't rebellious, of course, they, they, um, they, they were too. Um, and people, uh, you know, some of the, uh, characters do have quite large families. The Dyer, for example, the, the Dyer, um, there is affection between him and his daughter, which is, uh, you know, possibly has a, a, a darker side to it. I think I, I think I was, was hinting to that. She was actually younger. Um, in my original version of that story, she was a younger child than she is. I think she was 10 and uh, she had to become 12 because the publishers felt uncomfortable about the thought that she was, but of course, you know, women at that age could marry at 12, but that she, you know, the suggestion that she's promiscuous or sexually active at least, or she's, she's looking, she's looking for love. But even with, you know, even with bad characters in, in the books, you, you do have, um, you know, the sense that they are, um, they have strongly fe strong feelings for their family. And that's true of um, Andrew Wood, the coroner, who um, is not named in the first book, book, but his whose character develops as the books go on. And he acts in a way um, w which is harmful to Hugh in Friend and Foe because he's putting his own family first. Uh, so there is always sort of conflict between duty and family. But, you know, I think at heart I'm sentimental you know, <laughs> and I value my family above all else. So I think I think that's that's what's coming through. But I, I don't accept that that's anachronistic in any way or that, um, you know, that there are far too many um, contemporary sources that, uh, that, that show us that, that um, people valued and loved their families. Uh, in ways that were not just to do with status and, uh, and thank and, you and obviously and, and that really comes across and it's really touching these these different relationships even with flawed people um yeah. how it develops it also seems to me that you've got um a tremendous sympathy for for the position that women in this town and the society have. I mean, Hue and Cry um, shows different ways in, in which women can be vulnerable in ways that, that men maybe aren't. Yeah. Um, you know, the minute that Meg, Hugh's, Hugh's sister, um, shows that she's skilled with, with herbs, she doesn't yeah. have the option as Giles does to become a trained doctor, mm. even though Giles's cures are often rather more yes. <laughs> than Meg's. Um, you know, her, her, her herbal medicine actually works in areas that, that his methods yes. are a bit yes. scary um but you know uh, you you it seems to me that in this book and others that, that you've quite deliberately set out to explore um that gendered predicament I in early modern um situations yeah. I, I try to also um particularly in time and tide i think where there are women's worlds and men's world worlds i've tried to indicate that um you know the expectations of men also made things, you know, difficult, difficult for them, and and uh, you know the, the responsibility that men had, the, the the weight of responsibility that Hugh feels. But I do think that in Scotland, for women in that time, they probably had, um, you know, more slightly more independence than they had in the 19th century, for example, and and could do more, and you know, less than they had in the medieval 
period when, of course, women did, um, you know, did do all sorts of professions. But the wise woman would certainly have been um, more respected than somebody like Giles when it came to to who you went to if you were unwell for for, for practical application. And and they often ran as widows. They often ran their hus husbands' businesses. Um, you know whether they were innkeepers or printers, as happens in in the second book. And um, I, I think too the fact that um, women kept their own names in Scotland. You, you didn't you didn't take when you married, you didn't take your husband's name. It was only sort of beginning of 19th century when that convention, as it was, was be, began to be adopted, meant that they had perhaps were seen more as individuals and had a separate status. It's actually um, a bind when you're writing the stories because, um, sorry, I've just <laughs> been distracted by by questions that popping up. Um, and I've lost my track. What was I saying? Um, yes, it's an, it, when you're actually having to think of new surnames for every single character and she's not Mrs. Mrs. Honeyman. <laughs> it, it's problematic, but I think it does help to establish women as a as people in their own rights with a with a separate identity. And, um, you know, certainly in terms of inheritance and things they, they could um, inherit money and uh, and continue businesses. Um, you still need, I mean, Meg needs a, a man's protection because of her um, um, her health and, uh, you know, the fact that she's. But having said that, you know, Giles is also um, at risk of being accused of witchcraft and men were were too. So this is not, you know, it's not simply simply women. It, it, it's anyone who um, follows practices. <laughs> which, yes, I'm glad you mentioned that Giles and men in in 1588 that there's Absolutely. a man who's yeah, yeah he, he's yeah. in danger of being called a witch as well and of course, so and yeah not just women in, in the north Berwick, you know in the witchcraft trials and um, the famous ones uh there was a doctor a male doctor who was and also i think you know I, I, where witchcraft is concerned i think you do have to sort of factor in um <laughs> The possibility that there were people who were witches. I mean, obviously, by by which I mean people who thought of themselves as witches and did have malign intent and were, you know, domestic terrorists perhaps who were plotting <laughs> against the king. And and there would have been a very real threat there as well as all the um, the hysteria against innocent, um, you know, innocent still women um, who, who were living on their own and um, brewing up herbal tea. So. Um, that there's a spectrum there. There's a question from SC uh, and she's um, remind, uh, moving from witchcraft to, to much more um, realistic situations and she said talking about the woman how unusual would it have been for someone like you to marry an English woman and how difficult would it have been for Francis coming to a small place like St Andrews? So this happens uh, mm. by the time you get to 1588, yeah. which is the most recent book, Francis is expecting their Hugh's mm -hmm. first child. Um, and yes, this 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 English woman coming to oh, St Andrews, yes, what very, kind very, of a culture shock. Yeah, very difficult. And of course, of course, Francis, that happens at the worst possible time because it happens um, just after the execution of Mary Mary Queen of Scots. I don't want to give away too many spoilers for, for, for Queen and Country, but yes, I mean, um, Frances is peculiarly resourceful as well, and so <laughs> she, she does manage to um, adapt, but it would have been obviously a massive culture shock, and I, th I think I think it's, you know, there is some indication of that that in the book. But you have to remember, though, she, it is St Andrews that she's coming to, so... <laughs> Still, still probably one of the most international universities yes, in the United yes, Kingdom. Yes. So a long, long tradition yes, of yeah, that. Yeah. And, um, yes, and a, long, a long tradition of, of, of visitors from even from England too. But there's certainly, um, I think that there is a scene at the beginning, I can't even remember which one it is now, at the beginning of one of the books where um, an English peddler is beaten up at the fair. And that is based on a on a true event that happened in Dundee. Um, someone, you know, who, who comes because um, the the fair days attracted people from England. I mean, pe peddlers would walk um, to St Andrews from down south with their goods to attend the fairs. They, they were massive, um, and there is someone who's who's beaten up in real life because uh, because he speaks with an English accent. So um, early racism. 
We have a question from Kate. Uh, obviously, these are crime novels and, and your handling of Scots law is, is detailed and precise. Um, as we probably, uh, maybe we, we don't all know, but Scots law and English law are two different systems. Uh, and Kate's asking um, the question of you, to what extent was Scots law codified in the late 16th century? Um, I'm surprised, she says, how well regulated things are in your books. Um, I thought written law wasn't written down until later, so I thought you might explain to us uh, the, the, the the richness yeah, of, the, of that think, Scots law background. I think the College of, of Justice was um, came in, in the middle of the 16th century and yes there was some um, codification after that. There's a, a an excellent uh, book um, by David Walker which is the history of um, legal history of Scotland and I have the um, volume on the 16th century which is immensely detailed and it, it does refer to every um, every contemporary source and most of the um, you know most of the actual um, detail comes from that and then the stair society also have um, have, have a lot of um, a lot of resources from that just at that period you're on the um, again you're on the, the cusp with James um, public prosecution and crim of the, crim the criminal law began to come in um, at this time there wasn't really public prosecution in in the sense that we, we we know it now but the king's man the king's advocate eventually did become a, a crown prosecutor so you would still have things settled by blood feuds and you know blood white in, in, in some cases but the legal system it was very complex and there were many layers to it so it would start off with the Kirk sessions and then you'd have courts of frugality and baron courts and justice heirs where the traveling justices would come round maybe every six months and sit and and there's the high court in edinburgh which um which you see in the second book and depending on the um on the severity of the crown of, of the crime then um, you know you, you might pass from one one court to the other but um yes i mean it is sufficiently well documented for that what you read in 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 Freyden, um what's it called fate and fortune um, is as it was, but I have been accused of of, <laughs> of this perhaps being, you know, anachronistic, but it really isn't. Um, and you have a very good sense, Shirley, I think, about the different jurisdictions, that there are some types of crime or, or offence uh, which are followed up by the Kirk, and then, yes. then other things that are mm. followed up by, by the civil authorities, Absolutely. and, the, and these different jurisdictions are, are, are quite firmly practiced in, in the period yeah, you're talking about. They are and, and obviously the penalties that can be imposed because the Kirk sessions I think can't impose capital you know that they can certainly impose corporal penalties but not capital ones so you know the difference between adultery and murder for example um, may mean that you go into a higher court but the coroner um, Andrew with the coroner obviously doesn't mean what a coroner means in the English sense that's never um, never existed in, in Scotland and it, it doesn't to this day. But um, the coroner, the crowner was the king's officer and it was often combined with the role of sheriff and Andrew Wood was the, the coroner and sheriff for Fife. And it was his job to, um, well, to keep the peace, to keep the king's peace in, in, in the region and to, to look into, I mean, you know, there's no there's no detection here. There's no police force. You do have the town baileys and you have the elders of the Kirk session who would certainly report any malefactors to whichever who, um, whichever court uh, is appropriate. Um, Andrew Wood um, would serve writs if, if he uncovered a, a capital crime then he would report that to the justice clerk and they would produce a writ which he would then serve and arrest the person and they would be delivered up um, to the court either at the visiting justice heirs or, or to Edinburgh. Uh, um, but he was also on the Kirk session, so he would have been, you know, he, he would have been looking into <laughs> anything that happened in his jurisdiction and he would be responsible for it because, you know, the Crown could say, well, you know, what's going on, you know, some, there's too much um, sheep stealing or <laughs> at every level. There's a lot I, of, I suspect there's a lot of reporting of other people, a lot of looking over your shoulder and um, not a very nice society to be living in. A lot of neighbourhood watch type. <laughs> I have one last question um, to finish with. 
uh, and that is um, these are novels about university life, at least. It's a kind of Morse and St Andrews in the 16th century, at least in the beginning. <laughs> um, and reading it, I, I teach undergraduates now, and it struck me there are, you know, there are many of the problems that you, you touch on, which are actually quite contemporary, student yeah. anxiety, um, mm -hmm. anorexia yes. in young men. Yeah, um, yeah. How, how, similar do you think and how what are the differences and similarities between students in the 16th century and students today well i think obviously they're younger to start with um because you would be 14 when you went to um, to, to do your degree and you'd be there for four years so you graduate master of arts at 14 so so in a sense and um i suppose it, it's debatable whether people are um whether they had reached any kind of emotional maturity at 14 in those days. I suspect not, certainly they hadn't reached physical maturity. And I suspect that, you know, they would have been so cloistered through childhood that the sort of young men who went, of course, they're always men, who went to university um, will not be very mature <laughs> at, at that point. And some of them obviously struggled with it. But if you read James Melville's, you know, accounts, both of his time, um, as a regent in, in in Glasgow, when his students are, you know, sort of riot on the streets and they drink and they gamble and they draw daggers and they beat up the, the tutors and, and the rest of it. And his own, um, you know, innocence and difficulty when he's starting out and, and all of which influenced me very much and that he doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have enough money to, to join in the pursuits that the other students do. He, he can't afford to play tennis and golf, which of course is what the rich students do. Um, I think that their concerns are very similar to the concerns that the students have now. They're, they're worried obviously about um, pleasing their parents possibly more, <laughs> more than they are now, but then there are students who have um, those kind of um, anxieties too because of the financial anxieties that are put on them. I mean, I, I've thought that students nowadays have actually far more anxieties than I had when I was a student and school children too, that they're far more sort of conscious of the difficulty of making your way in the world than, than we had. I mean, when, we, when I was a student in the 80s, there were no jobs then, but I don't remember either when I was at school or um, when I was an undergraduate, there being so much pressure or so much, you know, feeling that you had to be good and better and that everything was so competitive. I think we just, um, you know, went to the pub and <laughs> well, well, with that, just around reading books and had a nice time. <laughs> As we come to the end of a year of COVID, when of course going to the pub seems an impossibly yes. luxurious thing to be even dreaming of. I feel so sorry for the students at the moment. It's, they can't do that thing. Um, but I would like to thank you, um, Shirley, for a fascinating talk. And to all of you from joining us uh, from all over today um, with your questions that you've put uh, to the technical team for their support. And other books in this series are, of course, available at any good bookseller near you, including the lovely Toppings in St Andrews. Uh, go safely, keep well and haste you back in real time, real presence in another year. Um, thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you.